Hello and welcome again to my physics online video lecture supplement series. In today's video I wanted to look at lecture set number eight, part number two, which is on the topic of momentum and of collisions. And basically the idea is that you have a pair of objects which can interact with each other by exchanging a force pair. It's a force pair, of course, because you have Newton's third law. If ball number one exchanges a force with ball number two, then ball number two also exchanges a force with ball number one. Equal magnitude, opposite direction. And the end result of this, collisions, by the way, are, are one such interaction in which a force pair may be exchanged. The end result is that momentum is going to be conserved in a system. And the energy may or may not be conserved before and after the collision. So you can lose energy through a variety of, of causes, deformation, uh, sound, heat, etc. So we've already talked a bit about how energy might be lost by a non-isolated system, and, and a collision often takes place in such a system. There are three basic types of collision. The first is the elastic collision, in which energy is totally conserved. The second is the inelastic collision, in which energy is not conserved, but momentum is. And you can figure out how much energy is lost basically by using what's called the coefficient of restitution or by using a percent elasticity, etc. The third type is what's called a perfectly inelastic collision. In such a collision you have what would be equivalent to zero percent elasticity and you could even think of it as a coefficient of restitution of zero in the sense that the two objects collide and stick together after the collision. So in this case energy really cannot be conserved although momentum is. And in this last case it actually arguably is the easiest one to solve for because after the collision the two objects are stuck to each other that means that they're going to have the same velocity. And the velocity that these two objects have is going to be equal to whatever the velocity of the object's center of mass was before the collision. The center of mass velocity doesn't change. So in a perfectly inelastic collision, the equation that you basically would get looks something like this. Um, two objects are going to stick together, so momentum conservation says initial momentum and final momentum are equal. That means that the mass of the first object times the velocity of the first object before collision and the mass of the second object times the velocity of the second object before the collision must be the total mass of both objects together times the final velocity. So that's pictured here and that's pictured here. Energy is not going to be conserved in this collision and in fact depending upon the parameters of the collision you may end up with a mechanical energy of zero afterwards. That's the case when you have two objects which collide together and both are stopped after the collision. Let's look at an example of, of an inelastic collision, specifically a perfectly inelastic collision. So there's a type of trick shot that you can do when playing billards in which you have a ball that is moving towards your uh, cue ball. So maybe you set the ball in motion initially and you shoot the cue ball at the other ball and the two collide head on and both come to a stop. There's actually another trick in which you can do something like what this shot looks like it's lining up to be in which the two end up spinning around each other. In any case, suppose that you have your first ball has an initial speed of 1.5 meters per second 
and you want to figure out what speed you need to give to the cue ball in order to get a collision in which the two collide and both come to a stop. How do you do that? Well, since it's a perfectly inelastic collision, that means that the mass of the first ball times the initial velocity of the first ball plus the mass of the second ball times the initial velocity of the second ball should be the total mass of both balls times the total final velocity of both balls. So this is the conservation of momentum equation. And presumably these two are initially heading towards each other and, and this one was given as at rest. So this one actually is zero. So in order for this to happen, you would need m1 v1i to be equal to m2 v2i. And so in order to get the speed of the second ball, you just solve. So that's going to be v1i times m1 over m2. And since they have the same mass, uh, both of them have a one kilogram mass. That means that these two go away, and so the final speed, uh, excuse me, the initial speed of that second ball is actually equal to the initial speed of that first ball, which was given as 4.50 meters per second. So if we ignore the effects of rotation and of friction, this is the condition that we need in order for both to be stopped finally. As a follow-up question, how much energy gets lost in this situation? Again, ignoring that the balls are probably rotating. Well, the total energy in this case is all kinetic energy. And so the initial energies uh, the final energies, excuse me, minus the initial energies m must be equal to this change in kinetic energy. So we write that as one half times the two masses times the uh, final speed squared minus the same thing but with the initial speeds squared. And so that looks something like this. Now the final speeds again were zero, so this goes away, this goes away, and so our change in kinetic energy, uh, again given that the two masses are the same, given that the two velocities initially were uh, same speed but opposite direction, we could write minus half and half is one, so basically minus m times v initial squared. And so this ends up being minus 4.50 meters per second squared times a kilogram. So we need to know what 4.5 squared is, and then we're basically done. So 4.5 squared is 20.25. So the change in energy of this system is basically that it's going to lose 20 0.3 joules of energy. So there's a variety of different ways of basically measuring how elastic or inelastic a collision is. The most common way of doing it is to determine a what's called a coefficient of restitution, and that's the ratio of the final speed after collision versus the initial speed before the collision. You could think of those two speeds, by the way, it's maybe easiest to, to do this if you have a small object and a large object. For example, a ball bouncing off of the ground or the earth. And that's usually the, the context in which you see this uh, coefficient of restitution in the simplest case. Uh, basically, this coefficient of restitution is the final speed of the ball immediately upon leaving the ground divided by the initial speed of the ball right before hitting the ground. 
And so if the coefficient of restitution is one, then you have a perfectly elastic collision and energy is conserved. If the coefficient of restitution is zero, that means that the ball hits the ground and does not bounce at all. It basically sticks to the ground. Um, you can also use for this coefficient of restitution the relative speed between two objects in the event that they are uh, both affected by the collision in, an, in a measurable manner. The earth, of course, is affected, just not measurably by this collision. If you have, for example, two billiards balls and they collide, then you should notice a change in speed for both of them. And if you get a coefficient of restitution of 1, it means that energy is totally conserved in that system. And if you get a coefficient of restitution of 0, that means that the two objects should stick together in that system. Whether they're both stopped or not is a different question. Another way of, of doing this is just to simply measure the energy loss fraction. This may be a more intuitive way of doing it, but this is not usually how it's actually done. For example, in the lab, you can measure speeds of objects relatively easily and then you have to calculate an energy loss fraction so it's generally more convenient to get a coefficient of restitution. This works reasonably well if both objects change however. And it can be contrasted, both of these can be contrasted with a percent elasticity as in for example the Colorado uh, PHET simulation of collisions. The elasticity of, of our collision basically can be measured as follows. If you have no energy lost and a coefficient of restitution of 1, then you should have 100% elasticity. If you have a perfectly inelastic collision, that means a coefficient of restitution of 0 and a 0% elasticity. That does not mean that E loss is equal to the initial energy of the system, however. You basically would have to determine how much energy is lost based on your initial energy and your final energy. Usually you end up calculating those. Um, for example, you can do this in the context of something like a ballistic pendulum, which we see in our lab classes on campus. Uh, for that, you need to know something about the pendulum's mass, uh, the ball's mass, and what the initial and final heights of the ball and the pendulum, uh, ball pendulum pair are. And the conservation of this is basically that energy is going to be conserved before the ball hits the pendulum, and then it's conserved after the ball is done hitting the pendulum but lost during the actual impact. So we did this in the lab and used it to determine our uh, lab gun's muzzle velocity. Just for fun, let's look at an, a uh, ballistic pendulum in action. Um, this is, I guess, courtesy of the Idahoan show. Since when did a little snow and wind stop an Idahoan from doing ballistics experiments? Uh, anyway, today I've got a basic ballistic pendulum for you. Uh, the way this works is I've got a, a target suspended on a rigid arm that swings in a bearing. And as that swings back and forth, it moves the needle on this protractor here. Uh, and the needle has just enough friction that it Move, you know, when the arm moves it back, it stays in position, and so it records the maximum angle to which the arm swung to measure the kinetic energy that was imparted to the target by the impact of a bullet. And there's a variety of things that we can use this for. There's a variety of tests that I want to do with this later on. But for today, I just wanted to try it out by doing some basic velocity measurements. Specifically, I'm going to be shooting a 44 Magnum round, uh, 240 grain jacketed hollow point bullet with, I believe, 18 and a half grains of 2400 powder behind it. So now I'm going to shoot the uh, ballistic pendulum with it a few times 
and calculate the velocity based on conservation of momentum. So, in case you have forgotten since watching the last video that I put up here, um, we used the Colorado FET program for collisions to look at elasticity in collisions. So I'm going to go ahead and actually run a few more collisions of that sort on this simulation just for to remind us what all this elasticity stuff that I've been talking about is. All right, so we're going to go ahead and put on the uh, kinetic energy. Here's my elasticity. And maybe we'll show the center of mass. And just for fun, we can show the momentum vector as well. So. Let's start off with the simple case in which the two balls have actually the same size. So the center of mass is in the center between these two objects. And I'm going to slow the simulation down just a little bit. And let's see what happens here. That was our perfectly elastic collision. Basically, this one gave all of its uh, kinetic energy and all of its momentum to the other one. The kinetic energy before and the kinetic energy after is equal. So initially 0.75 after the collision, still 0.75. This center of mass doesn't change its motion at all. So that is the simplest elastic collision scenario. Um, now, what would happen, for example, if we were to uh, maybe restart this thing? Uh, we can, let's see, I want to give a little more data here. We can have an initial velocity for the green ball as well. We'll give it minus one. So the two are going to be heading in exactly opposite directions for this collision. And I think they're going to collide right about where this x is. So let's see it. So notice the center of mass is not moving. They collide and they bounce off perfectly. They basically just traded momentum and traded velocity. And that conserves energy as well. OK. so. What happens if you don't have a perfectly symmetric system? Maybe one of the two is heavier. Maybe the other one is a little bit slower than the other one. Uh, let's make this, say, 0.3, and let's play. So 0.32 joules initially. Let's see where the collision happens. And then they don't exactly trade speeds. They don't exactly trade kinetic energies. You can see that the final velocity of this first one, the initial was 1. Now it's 0.95. This one was point th negative 0.3. Now it's 0.35. Uh, we can do it again. Maybe make this one a little faster and this one just a little bit slower. So this one's 10 times faster. And to make up for it, maybe we'll make the other one 10 times bigger. So initially, they have the same momentum, although the kinetic energy is not going to be the same for both of them. Let's try this. And hit. And this one pretty much kept the initial velocity that it had. But, but in the opposite direction, so same speed, opposite direction. This one pretty much kept its same speed in opposite direction. That is what happens when you have an elastic collision between two objects that are, uh, one is drastically larger than the other.
So let's try it again, maybe with an even smaller initial object and maybe an even slower uh, large object. Let's say that maybe it starts with a very slow speed. Uh, we'll restart it. And this one starts over here and let's see what happens in this case. I would expect at some point, you know, you can make the one of them larger enough, you know, enough times larger, that it should be basically stationary before as after with the collision, even with, you know, a microscopic initial speed, this thing still has a ton of momentum this way. So you can almost imagine this thing is moving. You see the collision here. It's almost a, a, a perfectly switch of speed collision. And if I speed the simulation up a little bit, you can see that this thing actually is in fact moving. So let's restart that again. Let's do it again with uh, maybe a little bit slower of a simulation speed but we'll give this guy an even larger initial speed. We'll make this thing actually be stationary. And let's slow this down because this guy's gonna be moving pretty fast. So collision, and there was a slight change in momentum for this guy in order to make up for the large change in momentum for the other one, but you'll notice that the speed is still very slow. So we're getting closer and closer to what it's like when you have something like say a baseball colliding with the earth. Um, I would need a lot more zeros here. I'm afraid it's going to kind of fill the screen by the time all said and done. In fact I can't touch my uh, uh, controls when it's this large. So maybe we need to make this thing a lot smaller and we'll restart the simulation collision and it bounces off and this one virtually not moving okay so that's the the perfectly elastic collision version let's go back to some more sensible values here and let's put this guy on screen somewhere What happens if the two stick together? So that's elasticity at 0%. So I need this guy to actually be moving towards the other one. And we'll just start off with them being basically the same size. Both have a mass of 1. And this is an obscenely high speed. So let's slow it down a little bit. Maybe speed the simulation up to make up for it and go. And what we should see is them stick together. So the momentum, the total momentum vector, if you were to add this yellow guy and this yellow guy, is going to be the same as before. In fact, with these two being the same speed and with this one and this one being the same mass, uh, the final speed of these two I would almost expect to be equal to the half of the initial speed uh, of this one. So let's do this again and let's see if it goes to one. One and one. And you notice that the energy also is halved in this case. We went from two joules down to one joule. Okay, last but not least, let's look at one in which we have a very large object and a very small object colliding and the uh, collision will be such that the two stick together. Um, so I'm going to start this ball over here. I'm going to move this ball here. Uh, I'm going to make this thing even smaller. Okay, and they're going to stick together. So let's see what that does. Uh, let's give this guy a, a nice big initial speed so that there's some momentum here. Even let's 
make it 100 meters per second so you can see the momentum vector in here. Of course, the speed vector is going to be off screen. And they're going to stick together. It had to move pretty fast. So they're stuck together, and now you see that there is still a momentum vector this way. Most of the momentum was with the green ball at this point, almost all of it. But if you were to measure the length of this yellow one, you'd notice that it's the same as the length of this yellow one here. So let's do this again. I'm going to slow the simulation down as much as I can so we can actually see it approaching. And there's the collision. And basically all the momentum has been transferred, almost all of the momentum has been transferred to the green ball. Just for fun, let's do a couple in which the elasticity is neither perfectly inelastic nor perfectly elastic. So, oops, just got to speed the simulation up just a little bit here. So energy should not be conserved here, and you see it is not. But momentum still is conserved. If you were to measure this yellow and this yellow and add them together, they would be the same length as this initial yellow uh, line. Slow it down a little bit here so that we have time to actually see it happen. And there's the collision. This length plus the length of this yellow arrow should have equaled the length of the initial yellow arrow. And again, we lose kinetic energy. It's not necessarily half of the kinetic energy just because the elasticity is 50%. We can lose any uh, amount of kinetic energy with an elasticity of 50%. Let's do this. And they're going to collide. Pow, wump. And in fact, you see that we lost more than 50% of the, the kinetic energy in this case, even though I didn't change the elasticity. So that gives you some ideas of what elasticity does to this problem. You'll notice that we couldn't just guess from the elasticity score alone how much energy is going to be lost from the system. Only if it's at 100% do you know that there's no loss. If it's at anything below that, you have to basically do some calculation to figure out how much energy ultimately was lost from the system. And, and you know, the, the simplest, again, is 0% elasticity. The two stick together, and then you have the initial speed, and you've got the final speed, and you do the math. And in fact, in this simulation, it showed what our initial and final speeds are. So you could, in principle, just do the math based on the parameters that were listed. There are, of course, some other types of collision which may occur that I haven't really talked about in those three basic types. Um, there's a complete rupture in which you lose energy because of deformation and probably also heating and sound. The final velocities of the two objects are not going to be the same. So this bullet has ripped all the way through the apple. The apple is probably going to have some velocity in this direction, but it's not going to be necessarily the same as with the bullets velocity is. There's collisions in which one object breaks, so um, maybe the bullet were to was a larger bullet hits the apple and the result is that the apple splits into a few pieces or totally shatters into many pieces. Finally there's the glancing collisions and, and other basically 2D collisions. I wanted to look a little more in depth at a pair of types of collisions, the totally elastic ones and the totally inelastic ones, uh, just a little more in depth. So if you have a, a perfectly elastic collision, then there's basically six parameters that you can play with. There's the mass of each object, and there's two objects, so there's two masses. There's the initial speeds, or basically the initial velocities of both objects. So that's two new parameters. And then there's the final velocities. So that's two additional parameters. Generally speaking, you're going to need to know a few of those parameters. So 
usually you end up knowing what the mass of the two objects is. Not always, but oftentimes you know what the mass is. And oftentimes you're able to measure either the initial conditions or the final conditions of the system as far as what the velocities are. But what you're able to get out of the fact that it's elastic is two equations. One which plays into conservation of momentum. So this is initial momentum and this is final momentum of the system. The other is the conservation of energy. Since it's elastic, the mechanical energy should be conserved. So here is the initial energy, here's the final energy. This is assuming, of course, that there's nothing fishy going on like springs or ramps or work done by friction, anything like that. But you can account for those things in this energy equation if, if the need be. And this basically gives you a system of equations and so long as you know for example, both masses and maybe the two initial velocities, then you have two unknowns and you can find the two final velocities. One example of an elastic collision would be uh, the PASCO, for example, and, and other scientific education equipment manufacturing companies make these little carts that roll around on nearly frictionless tracks and they have magnetic bumpers mounted on them. And the magnetic bumpers are set up in such a way that when they collide, it's actually the two magnets that sort of do the colliding for us. And so there's no sound in that collision and virtually no energy is lost. And so you can set up a pair of photo gates and measure what is the energy or what is the speed of each cart before and after the collision and, and then measure the cart's masses and, and verify whether energy is conserved or not. And so here I've actually written up a little example. I'm not going to work it in this video because it turns out I uh, have actually already worked it in another video elsewhere. Um, but if you wanted to work through this on your own or go watch that other video, this is the basic solution. One cart's final speed is 2.25 meters per second. The other one is 1.20 meters per second. Let's look at a different collision, though. This one is an inelastic collision. And it's an inelastic collision in which we need to figure out how much energy has been lost and also what the car's final speed is in some head-on collision. So we're given the mass of both vehicles, we're given speeds, and we're given that the one vehicle is stopped after the collision. Very often it turns out that a collision is not confinable to only one dimension. And so we need two or sometimes even three dimensions in order to actually define a given collision. For example, there's the glancing collision type in which one ball hits the other ball and as a result they sort of bounce off like this. And, and I'll actually show that on the Colorado FET simulation in just a minute. And in order to analyze these kinds of collisions, we, for now, would need to make a couple of simple assumptions. The first is that the objects are point masses. Um, that may seem a little odd of an assumption for a glancing collision, but bear with me on that. The other is that we don't want the objects to spin or rotate. If they start spinning or rotating, then we have to do a little bit more than just linear momentum. We have to start including things like angular momentum, for example. I wanted to look a little bit more at that simulation from the Colorado FET program, and this time look at it in two dimensions, among other things to, to show 
a few interesting things that we may see in these collisions. Uh, one is that glancing collision that I suggested on the previous slide. So you'll notice up here that there's a tab that says introduction. That's what we've been using. There's also a more advanced version. So here's a more advanced version. And these two balls are actually free to move around in two dimensions as need be. So I'm actually going to stick this ball here. I'm going to put this ball here. Let's give them initially the same mass. Uh, and let's make sure that the collision is still elastic for starters. And let's see what happens when these two collide. Notice that this ball is basically heading in this general direction. So what we're going to get is what's called a glancing collision. And so the two collide and notice that they bounce off each other like this. Now another thing that's kind of interesting to note is what happens when they collide with the walls of this uh, container. Uh, notice what these velocity vectors do upon collision. So right before the collision, here's number two. Ball number two is this one. It's at uh, minus 0 0.564 comma minus 0.496. Now let's see what happens to the velocity right after this collision. So now we're right after the collision and notice it is now 0.564 comma minus 0.496. So here I've written down those two before and afters again. And you may notice here that the only thing that really has changed here is the x component in this collision. It collided with a vertical wall. And let's go ahead now and look at the other ball. Ball number one is about to collide with a horizontal wall. And its initial velocity parameters, minus 0.436 and 0 0.496 meters. So here comes the collision, pow. OK. After this collision, it's now minus 0.436 comma minus 0.496. So I notice already that upon colliding with what might be called a vertical wall, that would be a collision of this sort, ball is coming in like this on the wall, and then it must leave like this on the wall, that the x component switches signs, but the y component does not. And in collision with a horizontal wall, that would be this kind of a collision, where it's incident like this, that the x component does not change, but the y component switches signs. So this means that the ball is actually obeying what's sometimes called the law of reflection. The law of reflection says if I draw a line like this that's perpendicular to the surface that the ball is hitting upon, then this angle and this angle should be equal. And this angle and this angle should be equal. These are sometimes called the incident angle, theta i, and the reflected angle, theta r. And we see this here with balls bouncing off of the wall. But it's also a very important principle in doing ray optics, for example. So when you bounce a laser beam off of a mirror, the incident angle and the reflected angle should be equal. All right, another thing that I wanted to observe, I'm putting in the center of mass now. So when the two collide with each other, notice the center of mass is still moving along the same trajectory as before. Watch what happens to the center of mass velocity though when a collision with the wall occurs. And there's a collision with the wall and you saw the center of mass velocity change. And one is about to collide with the wall and then two will. And we see some changes in the center of mass velocity during collisions with the wall. What that means is 
that the wall is actually not really a part of the system of interest. So the system of interest is actually ball one and ball two. Collisions with the wall basically involve an exchange of a force between something outside the system and something inside the system. Hence the center of mass motion will uh, change basically. Just for fun, we'll put a few balls in, and any time that there's a ball-on-ball -ball collision, the center of mass velocity stays the same. Any time there's a wall-on-ball collision, you see that the center of mass velocity changes. So to summarize some of the results from that sim simulation, uh, in two dimensions, these collisions become more complicated. That should almost go without saying. What you can do is basically split up the momentum into components and then solve piecewise with the components. So you have like a PX and a PY, and if in three dimensions, a PZ. And each of those components must be conserved if momentum is to be conserved. There's still the same elastic, inelastic, and perfectly inelastic collisions, although I really only showed the elastic collisions in this simulation this time around. And if you have walls placed around the objects, then these act as an outside force or an outside object that can interact with the system. And so the results are that the center of mass velocity is not affected by a collision between two balls, but it is affected by a collision between the ball and the wall. And if you have an elastic collision, then you don't lose energy or gain energy from these collisions with the wall. With that said, if you take away some elasticity, then you will start losing energy after each collision with the wall, and eventually the entire system will fall to zero energy until some additional force is applied to it. The law of reflection is the main law that governs collisions with some object like a wall and it basically says that the incident angle and the reflection angle should be the same and this actually is showing not the usually measured pair of angles because usually you measure perpendicularly to the surface you're reflecting from but if if the angles with respect to that perpendicular angle are the same then these two angles will also be the same. So let's look a little bit at a problem-solving approach for 2D momentum. Basically what happens when we have two-dimensional collisions. Um, we're going to be building off of the approach we've taken so far to the one-dimensional collisions. So the first thing we got to do is actually choose a coordinate basis. And once you have that coordinate basis, you can break up the initial and final momentum into Cartesian coordinates within the system. And then within each direction, you conserve momentum. So over here, this is the y part, this is the x part, this is the x part, this is the y part. This one is initially entirely in x. And what that means is that the y momentum of this and the y momentum of this need to cancel. And so you should have zero net momentum in the y part. And then the two x's parts should add up to the initial x momentum of this one. So you can use that to try and solve for the final velocity. In equation form, this is basically what this two particle system might look like. The initial momentum in the x direction should be equal to the final momentum in the x direction. The initial momentum in the y direction should be equal to the final momentum of the y direction. And so long as we have an isolated system, in other words, no walls around this pair of particles with which they can interact, then the change in the x momentum should be zero and the change in the y momentum should be zero. Okay, so net initial is equal to net final for each component. In one case, we have an object which is 
initially moving and another object which is initially stationary before the collision. This is sort of the simple case collision. And so we'll take the direction that the first object is initially moving in to be the x direction. So this is the x-axis or at least parallel to the x-axis or if you prefer unit vector notation this is the i-hat direction and so initially the momentum of this system is uh, m1 times v1 initial in the x-direction and so that means that the x-component of the momentum initially is this mass times this velocity. Uh, basically this mass times this speed even gives us the x component. And the y component, since neither one has any y motion initially, should be zero. Then after the collision has occurred, you see that both of these are now moving and they're moving off axis. In fact, if this one is initially moving along the axis, then after the collision, they either both have to move along the axis or they both have to move off axis. Those are the only ways that you can get momentum conservation. So what we do is we set this side right here equal to the final x components. And so the x component of this blue ball's momentum is going to be the blue ball's mass times the x component of the velocity, which is v1 final times cosine of theta. Here's theta, that means that this is also theta. And that also means that this is theta. So adjacent goes with cosine, opposite goes with sine, and that's where these two terms come from. This is the x component and the y component of mass number one's final momentum. For mass number two's final momentum, we also break into x and y. So here's x and here's y. And you'll notice that these two are plus, these two are minus. The reason why you have a minus sign here is because this and this need to be going in opposite directions with respect to the y direction in order for these two terms to cancel out and to get 0 equals 0, which is what we need. This is conservation of momentum. If the collision is elastic, we can also write the equation for conservation of energy. In this case, assuming that there is no change in potential energy and no forces doing work on the two balls, you get an equation that looks like this. One half times the initial speed squared times the mass of this ball that has the initial speed, and that's the initial energy. The final energy, half of this ball's mass times its final speed squared, plus half of this ball's mass times its final speed squared. And at this point, you basically have a system of equations that you can now solve for. One application of these two-dimensional collisions is found in bubble chambers or cloud chambers. And what these are is they're devices that are used to track the paths of mostly of charged subatomic particles. And the way they work is uh, kind of similar for a bubble versus a cloud chamber. It's a slightly different concept. But uh, if you have a bubble chamber, you basically heat some transparent liquid until it is near the boiling temperature. Then you alter the pressure in the chamber and then you allow some charged particle into the chamber. And what that charged particle does is it basically creates a little ion trail by ionizing other particles along the path that it takes. And then bubbles sort of form around these ionized points. The little ion trail will form lots of bubbles that sort of stick to it and that can be then photographed as they expand. And so you set up a camera and take pictures of these little bubbles and that shows you the path that the particle takes. And then a cloud chamber works similarly. You basically use a super saturated vapor and instead of getting bubbles you get sort of a little mist around where the particle is. In any case, what this lets us track 
is the path of a charged particle. So what about when there's an uncharged particle, like a neutron, in these chambers? Well, neutrons is going to tend not to ionize, and therefore we're not going to get the cloud or the, the bubbles surrounding an ion trail that can be photographed with cameras. What does happen, though, is occasionally you get a collision between a, let's say, a proton which is charged and a neutron which is not. And so you can watch the path of the proton deflect as a result of that collision. And actually, this little streak here is showing a collision between two protons because you can see the path of both particles after this collision has occurred. In the case of a neutron-proton collision, you'd see the path taken by the proton, but this part right here that's taken by the neutron would be invisible. So if you are trying to detect a neutron, you basically look for sudden deviations in the path of the proton. And you can do that by basically just observing the deflection of the bubbles and then observe how fast the proton is going afterwards, what angle it deflected at, and so on. And that tells you whether there was a collision with, say, a single neutron, whether it was some other uncharged particle with a different mass, etc. So what I want to do now is work through a little example of this. So suppose that you have a proton and it's incident on the bubble chamber from the left, as shown in this diagram. And in the bubble chamber, there is a neutron which is initially at, at rest. And it's worth noting that the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron are going to be very nearly equal. So we'll represent their mass by m. All right. The proton hits the neutron, and so initially it might be going in the, the zero degree x-axis direction. And after the collision, we see that it comes out at a 45 degree angle off-axis, and it has some new speed. And our initial speed of the proton is 15 meters per second. The collision causes it to leave at a 45 degree angle, and we're going to assume that it is an elastic collision between the proton and the neutron. Usually collisions between subatomic particles, they're, they're very often elastic or nearly elastic. And so what we want to know is, given this information about the proton, and given that the neutron was initially at, at rest, what is the final velocity of the neutron? In other words, what is its speed and what angle is it going to be leaving at? All right, so diagram here would basically say that before we have m and we have v1 and we have m and we have v2 is 0 and so this is v1 initial and this was actually given 15.0 meters per second and then after what we had is if this is the path of the x hat direction the proton is leaving that path like this. Call this theta equals 45 degrees. We'll call this V1 final. And the diagram is labeled as V1 prime, but I'm going to relabel it V1 final. Again, this is mass m. And then there is also leaving at a unknown angle and at V2 final, a second mass, M. And what we want to know is, given 
an elastic collision, what is going to be this final speed here and this angle here? So momentum conservation looks like this. We have M1 V1 initial. V2 initial is zero, so it's not going to show up in the initial momentum. Is equal to M1 V1 final times, we care actually in this case about the X component, which is going to go with cosine of the angle. So cosine theta. And then that has to be plus m2 v2 final times cosine of phi. Now, noting that m1 equals m2 equals m, we can basically eliminate the masses from this equation. The other part of the momentum equation is that we had no speed initially in the y direction, no velocity component in the y direction for either mass. And so zero must be equal to m1 v1 final times the sine of theta minus m2 v2 final times the cosine, uh, excuse me, times the sine of phi. And again, the masses are equal, so we can eliminate those. Finally, we have that 1 half times the mass times the initial speed of the first particle squared is a half of the mass of this particle times its final speed squared plus a half times the mass of the second particle times the speed finally for that particle. And this is energy. And again, all the mass terms can go away. And for that matter, all these halves can go away. All right, so we basically have our three equations. And even though we have uh, some known values in here. We're going to treat it as if I'm solving a system of three equations with some unknowns. So the there's basically four quantities in this equation that could be unknown. There's the, the two final speeds, there's the two angles, and then the initial speed is known. So four unknowns here seemingly three equations. So how are we going to solve that? Well, okay, in actuality we have a value for theta, so we really have three unknowns. This, this, and this are all unknown. This and this are known because they are given as 15 meters per second and 45 degrees. So this is theta. This right here would be V1 initial. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and just do some algebra with these three equations. I'm going to go ahead and number them 1, 2, and 3 just to um, keep track of them. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange equation number 2. So equation number 2 is the one that says that 0 is equal to this difference. So that means that this and this have to be equal. So V1F times the sine of theta should be equal to V2F times the sine of phi. Okay, now I'm going to use equations 1 and 3. So I notice that equation 1 has V1I on the left-hand side, and equation 3 has V1i squared on the left-hand side. So that tells me that if I square this side of equation 1, it should be equal to this side squared from equation 3. So basically, 1 squared equals to 3, uh, both right-hand sides. 
So the right hand side of 3, of course, is already given. The right hand side of 1 would be V1F cosine theta plus V2F cosine of phi. And so I'm going to square that, and that has to be equal to V1F squared plus V2F squared. So this thing squared is going to give me V1F squared cosine squared of theta plus 2 times V1F cosine of theta V2F cosine of phi plus V2F squared cosine squared phi and that's equal to V1F squared plus V2F squared. Okay, now we're going to use the first of our important trig identities. This first trig identity is basically an equivalent restatement of the Pythagorean theorem. It says that the cosine squared of any angle plus the sine squared of that same angle should be equal to 1. And so equivalently, that means that if I take 1 and subtract from it the cosine squared of an angle, I should get the sine squared of the same angle. Oops, my angle is x, not theta. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and subtract from both sides of this equation a v uh, 1f squared cosine squared theta and a v uh, 2f squared cosine squared phi. So that has to also be subtracted from the same, uh, from this side. And so I notice that there's a v1f squared minus a v1f squared cosine theta. So I'll go ahead and rewrite the left-hand side again. That's 2v1f cosine theta v2f cosine phi is equal to v1f squared minus v1f squared cosine squared theta and then that plus v2f squared minus v2f squared uh, cosine squared of phi. All right, well, this right here is just V1F squared times this difference in terms of theta. And this one, likewise, is V2F squared times 1 minus cosine of phi. So that means that I have 2V1F cosine theta, V2F cosine phi is equal to v 1f squared sine squared of theta plus v2f squared sine squared of phi. Okay, now I'm going to go up here and use equation 2 because if I square both sides of equation 2 it's still true. And so v1f squared sine of theta squared is the same thing as v2f squared sine of phi squared. So this term right here can be replaced by v2f squared sine squared phi. All right, so these two would combine to basically give me 2v2f squared sine squared phi. Now I want to look at this side of the equation and I need to use another trig identity. It's, again, it's kind of handy to have a nice little list on hand. And by the way, they put lists of these trig identities in a variety of places. You know, you can go to Wolfram Alpha to do it. You can get it out of the old CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. Uh, I'm obviously using this website, mathwords.com, and the trig identity that I want to use is not obvious at a glance from this 
list, but if it'll actually let me highlight it this time, it's one of these two identities. I guess I cannot highlight it after all. But if you have the cosine of x plus y, you get cosine x, cosine y, minus sine x, sine y. And if you have cosine of x minus y, you have cosine x, cosine y, plus sine x, sine y. So why would I look at those two identities on the list? Well, you can rearrange this side of the equation so that you have 2v1f v2f, if, if you so desire, times cosine theta cosine phi. And then, of course, that's equal to 2v2f squared sine squared phi. All right, so I got to figure that I see a cosine theta cosine phi, and that looks like part of these two identities down here because there's a cosine x cosine y and there's a cosine x cosine y. So the next question is which of these two am I going to actually want to use because presumably this means I'm going to be picking one of these two and rearranging it so that I have cosine x cosine y equals either this plus this or this minus this. So which one do I actually need? Well I see, by the way, that there's a 2 here, and there's a 2 here, and a sine squared phi. So it'd be awfully nice to do something over here that allows me to eliminate this term. And so that basically works. I'm going to go 2v1f v2f of cosine theta plus phi. And therefore, because I've picked the theta plus phi term, I'm basically using this equation. And so since I'm substituting for cosine theta, cosine phi, I need to add a sine theta, sine phi to both sides. So plus 2v1f, v2f, sine theta, sine phi, and that's equal to 2 v 2f squared sine squared of phi. Alright, you may be wondering how does this actually help us out? Well, again we can go up to this equation without the squared part of it and I notice that v 1f sine theta is equal to v 2f sine phi and so I have a v 1f here and I have a sine theta here. So this whole term, I can substitute a v2f sine phi. This term, therefore, is equal to 2v2f squared sine squared phi. And since I have uh, this on both sides as a positive, I can cancel it on both sides. And so the end result is that I can write... 2v1f v2f cosine of theta plus phi is equal to zero. And that's our basic important equation, our important result. Notice that I haven't plugged any numbers in yet. So this is a generally valid result for the case where you have two particles of equal mass in an elastic collision. Okay, so what does this equation imply for us? The basic implication of this equation is that there's three possibilities with this elastic collision between one initially moving and one initially not moving particle of the same mass. The first is that the final speed of the second particle is now zero. If that happens, then Basically what it means is this particle hits this particle, this one stops, this one starts moving. This second possibility is basically this one hits this particle and this one stays stationary and this one continues without any deflection at the same velocity as before, which is kind of an odd collision. It, it, 
basically means, I guess, the particles missed each other or there was no collision. The third possibility is the interesting one for us, the one that's actually useful for us in doing uh, these bubble chamber experiments. Although I suppose if you saw a proton track that just suddenly disappears, it would imply this first case in which the proton hit a neutron and the neutron left and the proton stopped. But the, the more interesting case usually is going to be this one, theta plus phi equals 90 degrees. So that means that there's a 90 degree angle between this trajectory and this trajectory after the collision. So basically this means theta plus phi is 90 degrees. And since theta was given as 45 degrees above the horizontal, so theta is right here is 45 degrees, phi down here must also be 45 degrees, albeit below the horizontal. Um, so that means that we've now actually described part of the uh, neutron's final velocity because now we know that phi is 45 degrees. The further implication of this, by the way, is that we can now basically find what is the final x component of the velocity for both. All right, we have that v1 final times the sine of theta was equal to v2 final times the sine of phi. But since theta and phi are both 45 degrees, these sine terms we might as well just eliminate here because they're going to be equal. So the final speed of the proton and the final speed of the neutron have to be equal. All right, so that's basically using equation two. Now equation one of these equations down here says that V1 initial should be equal to V1 final cosine of theta plus V2 final cosine of phi. Well, since theta equals phi up here, theta equals phi, and since v1f equals v2f, that's what we just found here, this is basically saying that v1i is equal to 2 times v1f cosine of theta. And so v1f should be v one i divided by 2 cosine of theta in this case, which was 15.0 meters per second given in the problem over here, divided by 2 times the cosine of 45 degrees. And so now we basically do the science equivalent of the victory lap, having defeated this problem, we put in our numbers 15 and we divide by 2 times the cosine of 45 degrees and out comes our final speed 10.6 meters per second. So what this means is that we now have the final speeds and directions of both particles. This one right here is going to be 10.6 meters per second in the 45 degree direction. So that would be V1F. V2F, that's this one. V2F is going to be 10.6 meters per second in the minus 45 degree direction, which is the same thing as the 315 degree direction. And so now we have totally solved for both velocities of both particles in this problem. So that basically concludes my uh, second part of this set of lectures my lecture on collisions, if you will. You 
should probably also watch the other videos that I've loaded from my earlier days, which would be the pre-Camtasia days, meaning I actually have some videos in which I work some examples uh, that I am just working using a webcam and the whiteboard. So you might want to watch those if you want a couple more examples of momentum conservation and energy conservation or non-conservation in collisions. And so I hope you found this video and the other ones that I made earlier helpful and thanks for watching.